Uh, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 17. Uh, Luke, chapter 17. Uh, thank you once again uh, as well, Kelly, uh, for your enabling ministry. Uh, I do not take it for granted. Um, you serve us really well. Luke 17, if you're there, say, oh yeah. yeah. All right, those were fewer than I had hoped, so I will give you a moment uh, to turn there. Luke chapter 17. Luke is in the New Testament. In case you're near Genesis, you're lost. Uh, keep going, keep going uh, east uh, into the New Testament. Luke 17, I'll read from verse 1 to verse 10. The Bible says, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the ship. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. And this is the reading of God's holy word. This is the reading of God's holy word. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. Praise be to God. Allow me to ask that we would pray yet again. Our Father, we thank you because in your word you reveal yourself to us. In fact, the pulpit is the throne from which Christ reigns his church. And so, Father, we thank you that you have chosen to make yourself known to us. And so, Lord, at this time I pray that indeed as Elder Kefadi pray that I would diminish Forbid it, Lord, that anyone but you would receive the glory this afternoon. I pray that you would eclipse me and that you would speak to me and speak through me. I pray that, Lord, you would fill me now with your spirit, fill us all with your spirit, so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be acceptable before you. And so, Lord, those things that we do not know, teach us through your word. Those things that we do not have, I pray that you would give us through your word. Those things that we are not, I pray that you would make us through your word. We pray this for your glory and our joy through Christ. Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say to them, Madeni. Madeni. Look at the other neighbor and say to them, Madeni. Madeni. If there's something that is common around us is debts, Madeni, uh, for the expatriates in this house. That is debts, Right? Um, one of the things that uh, our leaders uh, and those who wanted to become leaders would say is that they uh, would have an, a response for the challenge that we've had. Uh, we probably owe this, uh, we, we owe people, I, I don't know, you know, many people, uh, many governments, IMF, China, uh, over 9, 10 trillion, right? And many leaders were saying, hey, I think I have a response, I have an answer to deal with this. If it is not uh, national debt, it's perhaps personal debt. Uh, perhaps you're here and uh, you, you have some debts of some kind. In fact, many of us were perhaps helped uh, through campus, right? Uh, perhaps we, you've had to borrow for your business. You've had to borrow for one thing or the other. A friend of mine joked and said, uh, you know, he, he was trying to keep his friend accountable. And he asked him, hey, you need, uh, he knew this guy had taken a loan. And so he asked him, hey, uh, what did you do with the loan? And this guy said, I invested it in my health. I asked, what do you mean by that? He said, I ate it all. <laughs> Debts are, to use a big word, ubiquitous. They are always around us, right? If, if it's not us, it's probably someone else. And sometimes these debts cause us pain and they cause us trouble. Now, unfortunately, I am not a financial expert. Uh, and so I will not comment more on financial debt. But there is a debt that the Holy Scriptures talk about that I would like us to address this afternoon. There is a debt that every single one of us 
has, and I'm not talking about help. Uh, there is a debt that Jesus uh, instructs us about and helps us see how we can deal with this debt. In our Lord's Prayer, which we prayed earlier, Jesus instructs us to say, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Some of the translations, of course, and as we have said this afternoon says, forgive us, give us our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses so that we, uh, as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. Trespasses are debts. Those two things are the same thing. The word debt, as Jesus used it, means something that is owed. It means a due or a fault, something that must be repaid, right? Therefore, a debt occurs when one person wrongs another and vice versa. When you wrong, person, uh, when you wrong someone, you are in their debt. When they wrong you, they are in your debt. And so our text today begins with these words. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to sin are bound to come. Let me read that again. Things that cause people to sin are bound to come. The NKJV translates this very well. It says, it is impossible that no offenses should come. Jesus is saying something here very important. He's saying that it is literally impossible for us to go through life without either offending someone or being offended. If you are an honest human being, you know that that is true. You have probably offended someone in your life or someone has offended you. Perhaps with some exception, sometimes we think about uh, lovebirds who might be walking through the streets of town and you ask them, hey, have you guys fought? Have you had a conflict? Has somebody offended you? And they look at you like, are you the only one who, does, who doesn't know that she's an angel? Right? I digress. <laughs> but it is almost impossible to go through life. I should say impossible to go through life, either without offending or being offended. Perhaps for you, it's something as simple as a matatu operator who refuses to give you back your due, your change in these days of 179. You can tell this is a personal thing that I am struggling with. Fuel at 179, right? Or they took you farther than you, than you intended to go. Perhaps it's somebody who cut you badly in traffic, and of course the first thing you say is, God bless you. <laughs> I know that that's what you say, Mamruaka, right? When somebody cuts you off in traffic, when somebody steps on you, the first thing you say is blusher. <laughs> it could be hurtful things that somebody said. A father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a cousin, an uncle, an auntie, a son, a daughter. It might be a family member or family members who have attempted to take your property because you lost your spouse. It could be a colleague at work who keeps on backbiting and stabbing you. All of us have probably been offended in one way or the other. I mention all the, only these things, on, only a few things, but I'm sure there are a myriad of ways in which we may have offended or been offended. It is exactly three months to Christmas. Did you know that? Exactly three months to Christmas. And for some of us, we are probably looking to forward to family gatherings. For others, we know there will be a gathering, but there will probably be no family because of the offenses that have taken place between our families. I must admit that this subject is not an easy one because immediately I mentioned this, you've probably had images and sometimes pain that is associated with the issue of forgiveness. Jesus shows us a path to live debt free, to deal with our debts, to deal with our offenses. So I'll walk through this text in three movements. Number one, the prom problem with offenses. Number two, the practice of forgiving offenses. And number three, the power for forgiving offenses. Let's dive right in. What is the problem with offenses? Look at verse one of the text. It says, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Now, the word woe is strange to the modern ear. And that's because it, it, it's, it's a biblical word. Perhaps what might, in a very, very faint way, come close is the, uh, the, the French word, woi. <laughs> which, as teacher Wanjiko would say, ni arama ya muchagao. <laughs> but when the prophets in the Bible announced 
uh, words beginning with war, what they were doing is that they were uttering a form of divine utterance called an oracle. In the Old Testament especially, you've probably seen in the uh, prophets the oracle against Zion, the oracle against Tyre and Sidon. An oracle is an announcement from God. It is news concerning something, and it could be good news or bad news. Good news is a positive oracle. Positive oracles would be prefaced by the word blessed. So for instance, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount concerning the Beatitudes, he says, blessed is da dash dash, blessed are the poor uh, in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. His audience would immediately know what he was doing. He was invoking the prophetic formula. But there are negative oracles, and these ones are pre prefaced with the word war. This is an announcement of judgment or doom. So, for instance, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus announces seven wars to the scribes and the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You don't enter yourselves, and you don't let others in. To press this even further, Jesus says, that the person causing the offense would rather have a millstone tied around their neck and then throw themselves into the sea. That was a practice of capital punishment. The Jews practiced it. The Egyptians practiced it. The Syrians practiced it. If you committed an act of treason against your government, that's what they would do. They would tie a stone around your neck, throw you into to the ocean to guarantee that you would die. Why? Would Jesus say that if you offend someone, you would rather come under capital punishment? I submit that this is Jesus' hyperbolic way of saying that God takes personal offenses between people even more seriously than we do. Did you know that if somebody offends you, the first person they've offended is not you but God? And that God takes that way more seriously than you and I do. Friends, it matters to God how we relate with one another. Consider the Ten Commandments, for instance. The first four concern our vertical relationship with God. The other six pertain to our horizontal relationships with others. Don't offend people by stealing from them. Don't offend people by murdering someone. Don't offend, well, if you murder someone, you've done more than offend them. Don't uh, offend someone by committing adultery. Don't offend some, uh, your parents by dishonoring them. They are concerned with horizontal relationships. Jesus is saying, I care about relationships so much that I would have you know, I don't want you to go about the business and the practice of offending others. Do you see now why a text like Rome, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 19 makes sense? Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Jesus is saying, hey, guess what? When people offend one another, I am angry, and I will judge. So don't take judgment into your own hands. Let me deal with it. So that's the first problem with offenses, is that it offends God. The first person that is offended before we offend another person is God. But there is a second danger and problem with offenses. Jesus in verse 3 says, watch yourselves, take heed to yourselves. Now, Jesus says that there's something that offenses do to God. Here he says there's something that offenses do to us. When you and I are offended, the most natural and understandable response is that we are angry. And that's right, that's understandable. But Jesus is basically saying, hey, watch yourselves. You know why? Because the anger that results from offenses is something that needs to be checked. It, because it defiles us. It grows. It spreads. And if left unchecked, it gives birth to death. Some of you have known this very experientially. You probably had somebody who was sinning against you. Somebody who was constantly offending you. And that anger started boiling up, boiling up until it became an explosive anger. 
And one day, you acted out in rage, and to date you are facing the repercussions of that. You've probably watched telly and you've heard about people who kill their mothers, about fathers who kill their children, about brother that turns against brother. Friends, anger is a good emotion, but uh, like fire, it is a very destructive emotion. And if it boils up, it breeds bitterness, and bitterness is a cancer that destroys. And so James says in verse, chapter 1 of verse 20 of James, be slow to anger. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Jesus is saying there's a problem with offenses. One, it attracts the righteous anger of God, but two, it produces anger which often defiles people. All right, I'm sold. I need to forgive. But forgiveness ain't easy, right? So how do we forgive? Thanks be to God that Jesus gives us a path. He shows us the practice of forgiveness. How can we practice forgiveness? The first thing we must say is that forgiveness is something that it is practiced before it is felt. Forgiveness is something that you practice way before you feel it. Just as love is an action first before it is an emotion, forgiveness is an action first before it is an emotion. You might not feel like forgiving someone, but there are things that Jesus invites us to do which help us on the path to forgiveness. The first thing that Jesus calls us to do is to identify with the offender. Is to identify with the offender. How do I forgive? Number one, identify with the offender. Look at verse three, the second part. It says, if your brother sins against you. If your brother sins against you. Jesus is very categorical about his words. He doesn't say, if someone forgives you. He doesn't say, if anyone forgives you. He says, if your brother forgive, uh, sins against you, you must forgive him. The thing that Jesus is trying to establish is that there is a connection between all of us. Now, in Matthew 18, which is a parallel passage, we learn that the brothers there is fellow believers. And Jesus understands that the first natural place for a Christian to find offenses is the church. And he says, if your brother sins against you, and of course this means your sister as well, then you must forgive them. And then there's this little phrase where he says that these little ones, these little ones, and that's in Matthew 18. I submit that many of us perhaps have always thought, myself included, that the little ones that Jesus talks about in Matthew 18 is small children and their guardian angels. You know that verse where he says... Um, let me read that. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven there are angels. See the face of my Father who is in heaven. I always thought that that meant they are little children and they have guardian angels. But if you really read the context, what you understand quickly is that Jesus is talking about weak Christians. He's talking about brothers who stumble and fall often. He's talking about Christians who find themselves entrapped with sin, who find themselves offending others often. And Jesus is saying that every single Christian is precious to him. Their guardian angels are looking on with them, looking on to them with favor. This is a fulfillment of Jesus' ministry as the suffering servant in Isaiah 42, that a bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. Weak Christians tend to offend others more, right? Not to say that mature Christians don't offend, but the more you mature in Christ-likeness, the more God gives you the grace to love others. And the less mature we are, the more likely it is that we will offend. Have you ever noticed that children are more likely to offend us than adults sometimes? Because they don't know better, right? Because they are just being children, Jesus says, if even this little one sin against you, you must forgive them. Why? Because they are precious to me. But the question begs, is Jesus saying that we should only forgive Christians? Well, not so fast. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. Allow me to just read it for you. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything, catch this, against anyone, 
so that your Father who is also in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Jesus extends that principle not just in church, but everywhere. The principle, therefore, applies to everyone. It means that both Christians and non-Christians are people that we should endeavor to forgive. And Jesus is here saying, look at them as your brother. The first step to forgiving someone is to identify with them. To identify, one, that you are both sinners, and two, that you are both human. One theologian summarized it very well. He said, forgiveness flounders, or forgiveness uh, sort of is absent, when I exclude the enemy, the person offending me, from the community of humans, and I exclude myself from the community of sinners. When I forget that I am as human as they are, and I am as sinner as they are, then I will not forgive. But if I do remind myself and identify with the person offending me, then I am well on my road to forgiveness. So remind yourself that you are both sinners. Both of you have the same sinful nature, and therefore they are prone to sin in one way or the other, just like you. It is impossible, friends, to remain angry at someone unless, to some degree, I think that I am better than them. I think that, no, 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 I, I'm, not incap I'm not capable of doing stuff like that. But if I relate with you, then it becomes easier to forgive. Even more, the offender might not be in the family of God, they might not be a Christian, but both of you share the same Adamic root. Both of you are made in the image of God. That means that they are worthy of dignity. They are worthy of love. Have you ever noticed that when somebody offends us, we reduce them to their offense? If somebody lies, you're a liar. If somebody steals, you're a thief. If somebody cheats, you're a cheater. But that's not all they are. They are people made in the image of God. So Jesus says, look at them as your brother. Identify with the offender. The second way that Jesus helps us to forgive, he says, absorb the cost of the offense. Absorb the cost of the offense. He says, if your brother sins against you, forgive him. Now, the word forgive here is a financial term. It's a financial term. It means settle the score, settle the account. Now, Notice that Jesus says, forgive them. And then he says, if he sins against you seven times, saying, I repent, catch this, he says, you must forgive him. Now, you probably know your Bibles well. And you know that sometimes, many times in the scripture, numbers mean something. Seven is the number of fullness. All right? Seven is the number of fullness. What does Jesus mean when he says, if somebody sins against you seven times, you must forgive them? Is it that, Yanni, I am waiting because you are now at number six. And I am just waiting you for you to cross the threshold. And then, Utaniona. Jesus is saying something far worse. Jesus is saying this. When someone wrongs you as fully and as completely as any human being could wrong another, you must forgive him. When somebody wrongs you, as fully and as completely as any human being could wrong another, you must forgive him. I'd like you to do a small mental exercise. Think about the biggest offense that somebody has ever meted against you. Think about the biggest offense that anyone in this world, in any generation, has ever sinned against another. Think about Stalin. Think about Hitler. Think about pedophiles. Think about any offense. Jesus says, you must forgive. <laughs> the disciples in verse 5 said, Lord, increase our faith. How? What do you mean? How is that possible? What do you mean that if somebody sins against me as completely and as fully as one human being can sin against another, that I must forgive? At our Jesus. We will get to how to get there. But I need you and I to see the significance of what Jesus is saying. 
You see, when somebody sins against another, when somebody offends another person, there's always a cost. It's not a financial cost, but there's always a cost. If I lied to Lorraine today, I have robbed her of the truth. If I gossiped and slandered someone, I have robbed them of their dignity and reputation. If I steal from someone, I have literally robbed them. Right? There's always a cost to sinning against someone. Jesus says, settle the score. Now, you ask, how do I do that practically? Well, think with me. When somebody offends us, there's one of three things that we always, we often tend to do. The first thing we tend to do is probably hurt them back. If somebody offends me, I will offend you, right? In fact, that's why we get the word payback. If somebody sins against me, offends me, I want to pay them back. Another thing that we might do is to talk ill about them, is to gossip, slander, malign their name. That guy is such a dash, dash, dash. Or thirdly, we might keep that record of wrong, and if anything bad happens to them, yes! Mungu alali! Mtetezi wangu! Jesus is saying, absorb the cost by refraining from doing any of those things. Don't pay anyone back. Don't wish them ill. Don't malign them. Jesus invites us many times to treat our enemies with grace. He says, if your enemy is in trouble, help them. If your enemy is in trouble, give them that cup of water. If your enemy, that person who's really offended you right now, got sick and is in a hospital and there is a medical appeal, if you can, help them. You see, it feels good in the short term to either pay back, to either malign. Have you, have you noticed how when you're talking ill about someone, in a donjo, like it's, 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 there's something it appeals to. We feel good in the short term. Oh, but in the long run, it destroys us and it destroys them. So forgiveness means absorbing that debt. Choosing to say, hey, I will do good to that person even though they have done me ill. I will seek their good even though they have sought my ill. If somebody owed you a lot of money, if I went and told Elder Kifadi I'd like 50,000 shillings, and then at some point I was unable to pay, and Elder Kifadi said, you know what, what is 50,000 between friends? And then he said, that's okay. That money does not disappear into thin air, right? Elder Kifadi is absorbing that cost. He's saying, hey, I could have taken that 50,000 and bought something with it, and done something with it, bought Bibles to go with to Diani. But I choose to absorb that cost. A second way that Jesus is helping us to forgive, not only that we identify with the offender, those, that's your brother, your sister, he says absorb the cost. But thirdly, Jesus says seek the good of the offender. Seek the good of the offender. Notice again in verse 3, it says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. You're probably asking, does this mean that we should never confront somebody or that we should always forgive and let them walk over us like a mat? Absolutely not. The Bible says, when somebody's in the wrong, rebuke them, confront them, go to them and lay down your case. Say, hey, man, you have really wronged me. You have really done this. Lay your case before, before them. And you know what the text says? It says, if they listen to you, you have won. You have restored the brother. In other words, what this text is showing us is that when we are able to actually confront someone with their wrong, is that we are really seeking their good. Remember we said that the first person any one of us ever offends is God. So when you confront someone, you're seeking to restore their relationship with God. You're seeking to save them from God's judgment. Remember from Romans 12, 19, it says that let vengeance be to me. Why? Because my wrath, God is angry when we offend one another. So when you confront someone, basically you are seeking their good. 
You are going after their good. You're saying, hey, I want you to have a proper relationship with God. Sometimes we say, I'll forgive this person. I've let it go. But you never go to that person. The scripture invites us to go a step further. It tells us, seek their good. Go and confront them as gently, as wisely as you can. If somebody is living in sin, the church in Matthew 18 says, hey, take one, go, to your, go, the, go yourself and talk to that brother, talk to that sister. Say, hey, man, this, this is really offensive. If they don't listen to you, take another brother or sister. Go to them and tell them, hey, man, this is very offensive. If they don't, take even more. If they don't, take the pastors, address the pastors, tell them, hey, there's this beef that is going on here, and I'd like to sort it out, but it's not being sorted out. Please come help. The Bible says if they don't hear all those layers of confrontation, tell it to the church. How are we doing so far? Is this easy business? You're probably looking at me like, yeah, yeah, that's stuff that seems, you know, that, that will achieve in heaven. <laughs> Thank God that Jesus shows us the power for forgiveness. He has shown us the problem with offenses. He has told us how we can practice forgiveness. We identify with the offender, right? We seek to absorb the cost of wanting vengeance or wishing them ill will, and we begin to seek their good. Man, how do we do this stuff? The disciples had it, and they were like, increase our faith. And probably you're feeling the same thing. Praise be to God that Jesus does not leave us there, that Jesus shows us that there is power for forgiveness. Jesus does not just expect that we would forgive. Jesus empowers our forgiveness. Look at verse 7 onwards. I won't read. Actually, let me just read uh, it. It says, Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping the sheep say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Jesus shows and gives a parable that helps us see where we can get the power to do this kind of impossible task. He takes us to the marketplace. In those days, when people ended up in debt, you had two options. The first was that either the person who was, uh, to whom you owed money would throw you into prison. In Matthew chapter 18, that's exactly what that person does. He throws the person who owed 10,000 talents into prison. And then that guy left and he went and he started asking for people who owed him a denarii. And he said, give me my money now. The second option for, for you, if you found yourself in a debt you could not pay, was that you would sell yourself to this person as a slave. You, your wife, your children would become slaves and start serving that person until you are able to repay your debt. After seven years, the person to whom you owed your debt would release you unconditionally. Unless, of course, you said, hey, I have come to love my master. I want to continue serving you. But do you see the point that Jesus is showing us? Jesus, in a sense, is giving us an illustration of what it means to be in debt. So let me see if I can reimagine this for our lives today. Let me see if I can bring that parable to today's world. You begin a business and it picks up quite quickly. You're making sales first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. Three years on, your business is doing well. And so you decide, let me expand my business. You go to the bank. You say, hey, I'd like a loan of 50 million Kenya shillings. And the bank does its due diligence. They look at your books. And they say, it looks like there's something here. We want to support your business. We will come alongside you, give us some collateral. We'll give you the 50 million. And they do their due diligence, and they end up giving you the 50 million. Business shoots up. Now your operations are not just in Nairobi. Now your operations are all over the country. In fact, 
Within year two, you're able to open offices in TZ. You're able to open offices in Sudan. You're able to open offices in South Africa. Before long, you have some offices in London as well. And then COVID strikes. The very business that you have set comes under danger. Soon, the interests are racking up too much. You begin to have issues. Your heart pressure goes up. You suffer a mild stroke. You go to hospital. Some functions of your body start to fail. The banks are coming for you. The hospital bill is racking up. Your debts are racking up. There's no income. There's lots of outflows. And then a stranger. Somebody who doesn't know you. Somebody who does not even know that you exist. Hears about your plight. Right now, your liability is 400 million Kenya shillings. That's your liability. This person is worth, guess what? 400 million Kenya shillings. And that person decides to liquidate everything. They take the land that, was owed, that, that they own. They take the business that they owned. They take all their property and they liquidate it. They walk to the hospital. They pay off the 10 million debt. They walk to every bank that you borrowed. And they pay back the 390 million shillings. And they are left with, guess what? Nothing. Jesus says, that's what I've done for you. You are in the slave market of sin. You couldn't pay your debt. I had to liquidate everything. I left the glories of heaven. Jesus did not need us. Jesus was being worshipped perfectly by angels, including Lucifer. Jesus had everything in terms of wealth. And he liquidated everything. And he took on human nature. He took on a body, one that could get tired. He, he, he took upon himself human emotions that he could feel sorrow. And he walked to the slave market of sin where we could not pay our debts. Ours was the debt that demanded death, not just paying finances. And Jesus said, liquidate everything. I will pay the price so that you can be set free. Jesus did not just pay our debts at the risk of his life. Jesus paid our debt at the cost of his life. He lost everything. One of the most astounding things is that right now there is a man, human flesh in heaven. And that man has wounds on his hands. That man has wounds on his feet. That man has piercings in his side. And guess what? That's permanent. Jesus will not and did not let go of his body. For all eternity, we will always be seeing a man. That's what it took to pay your debt. Jesus is saying, if that's what I did for you, be willing to free those who have offended you. Be willing to free those who have your debt. In the 1930s, a revival broke out in East Africa. It started by, with two guys, a Brit, a missionary called Dr. Do Joe Church, and a Ugandan called Simeon Simbambi. And these two guys were just praying to God and saying, hey, we want to experience you. And so they started praying, and God sent a revival. Started in Rwanda, went up to Uganda where it got its name, to Kutender as a revival. And then it found its way to Kenya the 1940s and the 1950s. Around that same time, people were beginning to, to rumble against the colonialists, and they were saying, no, no, we need to take back our land. We need to take back what belongs to us rightfully. And so there was a movement. The Mau Mau started fighting. I have relatives, ancestors, who fought amongst the Mau Mau. A certain man called Festo Chivengere, he was an Anglican bishop in Uganda. And he had to flee Uganda because of Idi Amin's eight-year reign of terror. And he wrote a book called When God Moves in Revival. 
In it, he tells the sto true story of a certain lady, a certain family, actually. This family, they had the man who became a Christian and also led his uh, wife and children to faith. And so they were worshiping the Lord and, and thanking God, and these were the times of revival. And then, at a certain point, the Mau Mau heard of him, and they thought that this guy had actually become a collaborator with the colonialists. So they came, and they took him and his wife amidst many screams, and they dragged him to the village square, and they, they killed him in front of his wife and his children. During those times and those revival meetings, what would happen is that people would come to church. They would sing hymns. They would praise God. And then at a certain point, one of the other things that they do is that people would come to the front and start confessing their sins. And several months later, a young man went to the front. And he said, Pastor, can God forgive me for doing heinous crimes? I fought along with the Mau Mau, and I killed many collaborators. Can God forgive me? To which the pastor said, yes, God can and has forgiven you. But he couldn't believe it. He was like, how can God forgive murder? I killed a man. I killed a man in front of his wife and children. And as he knelt there weeping, he felt a hand on his shoulder. And he said, dear brother, not only does God forgive you, I too forgive you. This was the same lady, the same widow, whose husband she had killed. And this lady took this young man, together with her sisters, they housed him. They went and lived with this young man. They hid him when the Mau Mau's would come looking for other collaborators. They taught him a trade so that now he could begin to sustain himself. How are we able to do stuff like this? It's only when we look to the cross. Because that woman knew I have been forgiven of a far greater, far grander astronomical debt so I can forgive this debt. Friends, one of the problems is that we view our sins with such small eyes. We think of our sins as very little. We think of our sins as very trifle. Jesus paid it all. Isn't that what we have sung this afternoon? Oh, we must forgive. Four quick applications. Five. Number one, unbeliever, do you realize that you are in God's debt and that you can't pay it? Your sins have racked up against you. You are in the dock and you have been declared guilty. You can't pay your debts. Only Jesus can. So flee to Christ. If you're here and you are a non-Christian, you are attempting to go to God on your own merits. You're attempting to go to God without having a cover. You will not manage to pay that debt. I plead with you, flee to Christ. He needed nothing, but he lost everything, spared nothing, so that you might have everything. Turn to Christ. You are in danger. You have a debt that you cannot pay, and unless you run to Christ, you will not be saved. Secondly, are you here this afternoon, and you're plotting vengeance? You're probably thinking about ways in which you will, offer, you, you will hurt somebody who hurt you so bad. I plead with you, leave vengeance to the Lord. He cares about that way more than you do. And he is a far better judge than you. Thirdly, believer, if love is the currency of heaven, then forgiveness is the currency of earth. If we are to have healthy, wealthy relationships, then we must trade in this currency. Husbands, forgive your wives. Wives, forgive your husbands. Children, forgive your parents. Some of you are walking around with father wounds, with mommy wounds. Forgive them. Parents, forgive your children. Sometimes children sin terribly against their parents. They say stuff. They do stuff. Oh, that God would give us all grace to forgive. I remember a friend of mine telling me how he spoke with one of the older gentlemen who has since gone to be with the Lord a couple of years now, Mr. Mwiti. He's a member of Mamlakayo Chapel. And one person asked him, 
How have you remained in this marriage for so long? And he said two things, honesty and long-suffering. Honesty and a culture of forgiveness. You see, Mwiti understood that in marriage, the currency you operate on is forgiveness. You have to keep on forgiving one another. If you are here and you're in a relationship that you're hoping to get that will lead to marriage, that's what you're getting yourself into. If you're here and you want to get into a relationship, this is the long last, the long life business that we have to do, which is to forgive. Fifthly and lastly, let me ask that God will give us grace to love. Because the more we love people, the less we will offend them. The more we love people, the, the more we express love for all, the less and less we will offend them. The more we mature in the faith, the less we will offend us, offend them. Father, we thank you. We thank you because you don't just expect us to do things. You don't just expect us to follow you. You empower us to follow you. Thank you because, God, you don't just expect forgiveness from us. You also empower it. And in the gospel, in the cross, we have all the resources that we need. So I know, Lord, that there are many here who need to do business with you. There are many here who perhaps, as I spoke, were thinking of certain relationships that need mending. God, give them grace. Give them grace. Help us to turn our eyes to Jesus and to look fully into his face and wondrous grace so that all things of earth, including all the offenses, would grow strangely dim. We pray this for your glory and our joy through Christ. Amen.